Thank all of you for, for logging on. We're just getting ready to start here in about seven seconds. Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. There's the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joint and the marrow and the critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And all scripture is God breathed. And it's profitable, profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. What do we say? Spiritual spin stops right here because we really care for you. Steve, give us about 15 seconds again to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and operation cry. And you go ahead and close out our prayer time and we'll pick up our study. Father, we thank you for the freedom and the privilege of studying your word, especially in times like these. We really more than ever need to put on the whole armor of God and be prepared yes. to uh, the spiritual warfare that's all about us. So we ask your blessing on what is taught here tonight, that we will understand it, absorb it, and put it to play in, in our lives in the marketplace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, one, one thought here after we indicate what we're going to study tonight. Second Philippians chapter two, verses 10 through 12. This, this particular study, I've probably spent as much time or more time on this particular study than anything that I've done in a long time. And the reason I did that, had to do it, is because I was discovering that what I believe to be is something that has been mistaught for I don't know how long. And in terms of wanting to make sure that I'm clear in what I'm talking about tonight, uh, I had to spend that extra time preparing. So with that in mind, verses 10, 11, and 12 in, in Philippians, and I wanna make, uh, make aware again that this coming Sunday is in fact the Bible Class Fellowship Luncheon. Uh, very slow response at this point, but I want you to uh, to get back with me if you plan to attend. And when you again, when you look at the weather, it's uh, trying to scare us in terms of maybe some bad weather. But I want you to indicate to me that you're going to come or not going to come. Uh, you don't have if you if you're not going to come, don't don't respond. But if you're going to come, go ahead and respond. And please respond in light of the fact that you think that the weather's going to be okay. Then if you find out it's bad, then just stay home. But I'd like, for, I'd like to at least have an idea how many are going to be there. <clears throat> That's this coming Sunday, uh, American Pie. Now, let me, uh, let me turn to my notes. And we're going to start in verse 8. After we do just a brief review on the 8th types of death in the Bible. Now, what do I mean by that? As we read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you're going to find the word death used in eight different ways. So that when you're trying to make sense out of the scripture, you're trying to understand what God's trying to tell you. If you see a word and you don't have an idea about what that word means, you're going to miss what God's trying to tell you. And this is why when we study, when we study the Bible, we study it categorically. We have vocabulary, but we take that vocabulary and run the scripture on it and determine that that word in the Bible is used in more than one way. There are several words that that happens with. But one of those is the word death. Now, the reason we're going to do this eight re a review of the eight deaths spoken of in the Bible is because Two of those deaths are coming up in terms of what we're going to do when you take a look at Christ on the cross. So let's begin to review, and I'm not going to run this. You can, you can read the scripture on your own. I just want to review what these types of death are and explain what they mean. The first one is spiritual death. And spiritual death is separation from God in time. 
Now, basically, what we're talking about there is you're born separated from God. So you're born spiritually dead. I remember many, many years ago, would have been 19, oof, would have been 1980, 1988, I believe is when it was, when I when I preached in Almond Dross Gym in Davao City, Mindanao. And I was talking about spiritual death. And at that point in time, if I remember correctly, there might have been 3,000 people there. It was a large crowd. It was a big auditorium. And I made the comment to those folks that were there that you are born spiritually dead. And I had somebody that was a pro very prominent person in that area who rejected that notion and, in fact, was teaching that you are not spiritually dead until the moment you sin the first time. But you have an old sin nature in every cell of your body from the moment of conception. You're not a human being until you take your first breath. But you are spiritually dead, and so you are separated from God from the moment you are born physically. The second death, number two, is in fact the second death. And while in time, in human history, in your lifetime, you're born spiritually dead, but if you die having never become born again, having spiritual life, you have the, you have the second death, which is the perpetuation of spiritual death into eternity. And that can never be reconciled. You're spiritually, it's the second death and you die of that. It's not physical now, it's just, it's spiritual death. But it's a second death and you're spiritually dead for all of eternity. The third death is physical death. And physical death is separation of the soul from the body. You are a human being, not because you have a body, but because you have a soul. That's the real you. The soul is the real you. It's invisible, you don't see it. But it's inside of you. The, uh, the body houses the soul. Now, what happens when the soul separates from the body, you're dead. You're physically dead. In terms of an unbeliever, it's the soul leaves the body. In terms of a born-again Christian, it's the spirit and soul that leave the body. But physical death is a separation of the soul from the body. Sexual death is the inability to procreate. We have examples of that in the Bible where, where men and women were, able, were not able to procreate, were not able to have children. That's sexual death. We have a lot of that problem even today, sexually, sexually dead. Then there's positional death. And this positional death is actually identification. What's that? Oh, operational death. Yes, okay. Yeah, operational death is number five. And that's the inability to be able to produce divine good. Remember, there are two different kinds of good. There's human good and divine good. And God wants divine good to come from your life. And the only way you can produce divine good is to be doing his will, whatever it is, and do that in the sphere of the spirit. That's why you have to understand rebound and operation cry. So that you live in the sphere of the spirit. And when you are doing good works in the sphere of the spirit, that's divine good. But positional, uh, but operational death means you are operationally dead. <laughs> You're producing human good. And simply because all the good that you're doing, you're doing it outside the sphere of the spirit. We call that operational death. Then there's positional death, and that's identification with Christ, his spiritual death on the cross. So the moment you become a born-again Christian, the, the plan of God is to, is to take your old man and your old woman and place it on the cross with Jesus Christ. So that there has to come a time in your life when you realize that there was more on that cross at the time that Jesus was there. He had, a, had two people, on uh, one person on either side of him, only three people on that hill. But the truth of the matter is, is that every born-again Christian, at the moment of their spiritual salvation, God the Father took that old man and that old woman and placed it on the cross and put it to death with Christ. So positional death is your identification. It's it, it, you get you say you get saved in 2022, but in 2022 God takes your old man or your old woman and takes it all the way back to the cross and places it back there at that time. 
as positional debt. But by the way, as positional debt, but we've sometimes referred to that as retroactive positional debt because you're going backwards. You're going back to the cross, okay? Then cosmic death, sometimes we refer to it as carnal death, but this is the believer who's functioning with their volition and converting temptation into sin. So basically what this means is cosmic death is when you're when you're functioning in the sphere of the flesh. You're committing personal sins. You are a carnal believer. That's cosmic death. That's carnal death, okay? And then the last one is the sin of the death. And this is premature, premature physical death of a believer who's, who's living a life of prolonged carnality and or reversionism. And what that means is you die when if you're failing as an ambassador for Christ, and God says, okay, I've knocked on your door many, many times. It's time to get you out of here because you're failing as an ambassador. I'm calling you home. So there are those eight, there's eight deaths found in the Bible. So when you, when you see dead, dying death in scripture, and you wonder, well, what are we, and this, especially in the, in the, in Pauline epistles, you have to ask yourself, what kind of death are we talking about? Now, let me review basically verse eight and nine. Verse eight says, and we're going to we're going to tra- this. This is the way we we uh, came up with the translation after exegeting the passage. It says, in fact, although having been discovered in outward appearance as a man, now what we're seeing here is Christ is on the cross, and remember the theme. The theme in verse eight is Christ humiliated. That is, he uh, he was he's uh, undiminished deity. And yet he determined, according to God the Father's plan, to become a human being. Now that's humiliation. When he went to the cross, he was beaten. He was skinned alive. Crown of thorns on his head. Humiliation, okay? Then from 12 noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, God the Father poured the sins of the world out on him. And God the Father and Jesus were separated for three hours more humiliation. So in verse 8, we're seeing Christ humiliated. And I've, I've indicated to you this, this whole passage in, in Philippians chapter 2 is dealing and focusing on the person of Christ. So while we hear so much about him, I would suggest that many believers don't have a, whole, a good understanding of him other than the fact that he says he's the son of God, he, you know, he is God, and that he went to the cross, etc. But when you see verse 8 here, and see him humiliated. Then what we find, it says here, he he humbled himself. Now watch this, please. It says, in fact, although having been discovered in outward appearance as a man, remember this, they, they, they stripped him, stripped him of all his clothes. He's hanging there. Well, obviously, you can see this is a, this is a man. So in outward appearance, he was a man. But he says he humbled himself. Now, how did he humble himself? What, how, did he, how did he come up with that attitude? Here's how he humbled himself. By becoming, a, a, by becoming obedient to the point of spiritual death. This is the three hours of separation. And, the, and when you see the agony, we talked about, we talked about the pain of Christ leading to the cross. We talked about the physical, the mental, and the emotional uh, pain while he was on the cross. And realizing that he knew from eternity past, this is where he was going. And when he got to the garden of Gethsemane, he's in there pleading to God about whether or not he's going to go through with this. And we we said that after you realize the, the suffering that he went through to the cross and then on the cross, the next time you get ready to sin and realize what you're going to do and realize that's what put him on the cross. In order to pay for this, maybe we might think twice before we get involved, okay? Then it says he's, he's, uh, he became obedient to the point of death. That is the spiritual death of the cross. Then in verse 9, we move from humiliation to exaltation. Because he followed through and did exactly what God the Father wanted, then God is going to exalt him to the maximum. And what does it say he did? Therefore, also, God the Father then has exalted Christ to the maximum and has bestowed on him the rank which is above every rank. 
There's no one like him. And he is the one who is seated at the right hand of God the Father in a position of authority and a position of rank. Now, so we have humiliation, then we have exaltation. Now we move into verse 10. And in verse 10 and verse 11, this is where I had to spend hours reading, studying, not just looking at one passage. I'm looking for answers anywhere I can find them. Because what I was seeing was, was contradicting what I had been taught and what I have taught in the past. And I want you to see this. There's not, not, not going to be any argument. I'm going to tell you what it says and what it means, and you're going to have to live with it. And here's the issue. In verse 10, he said, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and those on earth and under the earth. Now, I want to ask you a question. When it says here, and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. You, what have you been taught that, that actually is refer, referring to? Do, you, do you, anybody, do you have any, any remembrance or recollection of that? I know I did. And when I, when I saw this, as a matter of fact, I may have even mentioned, get it coming up to this verse, I may have mentioned this. It was the great genuflex. Okay? Every knee shall bow. And what we've been taught and what we've been told, basically, is that when you get to this passage, what this is talking about at the moment of the rapture, your physical body comes out of the grave. It's joined with the spirit and the soul, and they meet in the, they meet in the air with Jesus. And the first thing that the body of Christ does in the air is this great genuflex acknowledging Jesus for who he is. Now, are you, have you heard? Okay. That's what I've been told this means. So when you read this in verse, verse 10, so at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Okay, now let me show you something here. Let's, let's pull that verse apart and exegete it. The first phrase, so that, is the Greek word hina, H-I-N-A. And it means so that, or in order that. And it has to do with what, what the humiliation in verse 8, the exaltation in verse 9, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. In other words, we've seen him, we've seen him suffering. Now we've seen God the Father exalt him to the maximum. Now, what happens when you see this with the when you see this exalted Christ, he's your savior. He's the one you're, you're transformed into the likeness of. It's the one that you're thinking, feeling, speaking, and doing exactly like. And boy, all of a sudden, you know, you get to meet him for the first time in the air. And so at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That's where this big genuflex is supposed to come in. Now, at, when you're exegeting this, so that, or in order that, at the name, and that, that phrase is, act, that's good too, so that at the name of Jesus, Jesus, that's Jesus, this is referring to the uh, to the humanity of Christ. So at the at the name of Jesus, as a human being, every knee, and that is pos ganu, which is every knee. Now the next two words. What's the next two words? Will bow. Now there's a problem with that. It's on pay, on pay, top of page two. The phrase will bow, and this is where this is where the 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 grammar comes into effect and had i not and had i not looked at the grammar here i would have just gone on and said okay that's this is okay this is the big the, the big genuflex or however you want to call this every knee bowing it's time of the rapture you meet jesus in the air and boy everybody just falls on their face this this word the phrase will bow is actually the greek word komptau K-M-P, K-M-P-T-O, Comptow. Now, actually, the grammar, it's a third person singular, which would be it, 
referring back to the knee. It then, and the and it's it's an aorist middle subjunctive. Now here's the issue: it's an aorist middle subjunctive. Now you say big deal, okay? Aorist middle subjunctive. What what in the, what does that mean? See, you may not know what that means, but if you're studying the language and you know what a subjunctive mood is, I'm going to tell you in just a second. But that is an aorist middle subjunctive. And it, it should be translated should bow. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Stop and think with me. Forget your papers. I want you to think about will bow and should bow. If you, if you will bow, I want to ask you, are you going to bow or are you not? Every knee will bow. I want to ask you a question. Every knee should bow. Maybe you will and maybe you won't. That's exactly right. That's what this word means. Every knee should bow. Now what we're going to find out is who is it that should do that? We're going to see that in just a moment. So what we need to realize is this is so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And then it's going to give you three different groups of people, that uh, three different groups that should bow. And the first one is, the, the, actually, the the English translation is very uh, it's it's very full. It's expansive because while the English said every knee should bow, and then it's going to tell you who it is of those who are in heaven. The only problem there is the word heaven is plural. In the heavens, okay, and we know that there are three heavens: the Earth's atmosphere, stellar space, and the third heaven, which is the throne room of God. So this is heavens, okay, of those who are in the heavens. Now watch this. Actually, there's only there's only one word. The English says of those who uh, of those who are in heaven. That's six words. But there's only one Greek word there. Eperonios. And it's in the genitive case, which means it should be translated of the heavens. Now watch this. So every knee should bow, first group of the heavens, meaning whoever it is up there is in heaven, they're going to bow, okay? Then the next phrase is, and on earth, that there's th three English words there. There are two Greek words, epigeos, chi epigeos, and that's translated literally, and of the earth. So Every knee, every knee should bow of the heavens and of the earth, and then and under the earth is Kai, and then that big Greek word there, and it means and of under the earth. So what this is saying is this, going back and reading the whole verse, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and who's going to bow? Those who are in heaven, those who are on earth, and those that are under the earth. Now, what we have to ask ourselves is, who are those? So let me let me give you a translation of that verse then. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Now I want you to show you something here, too. This is where this is where when you if all we're doing is reading the scripture, it's very likely we're going to come up either short of what what we uh, we should be understanding come up short in terms of what we should know but it says so that at the name of Jesus and here's the issue at the name of Jesus I want you to, I want you to see something here um let's let's say with the five of the, those of you are sitting here in front of me let's say Marshall sitting there and uh, we're all very quiet and Marshall says, oh, Jesus, you know, thinking, it, it, wanting to honor him. He said, oh, Jesus. Now watch this. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. I want to ask you a question. He just said, Jesus, what are you going to do? Come on now, what, is it, what does it say you're going to do? Bow. You should bow, okay? Now the question is, does that really mean that? And that's what we're going to see. Okay, so 
uh, everybody falls on their face here and gets down on their knee because he says Jesus. And, uh, and uh, Steve says, I think I'll try that. Yeah, I love Jesus. Well, bingo, there he goes, Cody and all the rest of you, down on your knees again. And Cody, Cody says, I, you know, that's not bad. I think I like that. I want to do that too. So he says something about Jesus. And bingo, down on your knees, you go again. Well, Janet does the same thing, and that does the same thing, and I come up and say, ah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And boy, now you're up and down, up and down, up and down. He says, so at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And the question is, is that really what that means? We're going to see it in a minute. So let's, take, let's do this. Let's take that phrase, should bow. Again, it's a third person singular. It's an aorist tense, middle voice, and subjunctive mood. Now, the question is, as a subjunctive mood, now, I listen, I want you to see this. I want you to read it with me. I want you to look at it, and then I want you to think it through, because I'll tell you what, everyone in this room and everybody online with me has enough brains to figure this out and see what this means if you'll just think. So the question is, what is the subjunctive mood in the Greek language? The, subjunct the subjunctive mood presents an action or an event. Now hold it right there. Uh, okay, if that's the case, in this verse, what is the action or what is the event? Bowing. There, that's good, Steve. Stop right there. The event is bowing. So it's going to, the subjunctive mood is going to present the action or an event as something wanted or expected. Now, so let me ask you this. The, the subjunctive mood is going to talk about something that's expected or wanted. I expect this to happen. I, I want it to happen. Does that mean it will? Come on now. No, it doesn't. So I want to, I want to show you the meaning of this, okay? So he said the, sub, the subjunctive mood actually presents an action or event as something wanted or expected. The action, now watch this, the action is not considered as an objective fact by the speaker. Do you see what that means? In other words, when you say you should, you should bow, the person who's making this statement doesn't expect you to necessarily do it, okay? The action is not considered as an objective, an objective fact by the speaker. It may be, it's something you said, maybe will, maybe you won't. In other words, the subjunctive mood indicates what the subject of the verb the subject of the verb wants can may or must do or is expecting to do are you are you hearing what i'm saying look at that again now in other words the subjunctive mood should bow indicates what the subject of the verb wants can may must do or is expecting to do okay now, here's another interesting thing. If you're reading through the, uh, if, you, if you have Bible Hub on your, on your uh, computer or on your phone or whatever, and you go out there and you're, you're searching around in, in Bible Hub, you go to verse 12 in, in, second, in Philippians chapter 2, and when you go to look at the, the Greek sentence and the grammatical construction of this, you can actually search on the word in many different ways, one of which is it will give you it will give you that word in every translation available out there. And they've got here you got look here, Steve. See, you got a list about this long, okay, of, of translations. So what I want you to show what I want you to see is what translations, and I didn't name them all. I just I, I got a few of them out here, some that you'll recognize. I want you to see which versions actually use the word should. And the interesting thing is this, that I have, I have become familiar and use the New American Standard because the New American Standard, we are told, and I, I find it relatively true, that it is the, most, is the most precise and accurate translation when you're moving from the Greek to the English, okay? The only problem is, is the New American Standard uses the word will. You follow that? So here are some versions of the Bible that actually translate the subjunctive mood should bow. 
first of all, the King James Century 21 version, the American Standard Version. Now, these, these, are, these are versions that we would uh, understand. Darby translation, you've probably heard of it. I've never seen one. The Douay version, the Douay Reims 1899 American edition. The Douay version was actually a Latin version. Then there was the the English, the English Standard Version. That's the it's called the ESV. Many people are using the ESV. Pastors are using the ESV. How about this one? The King James Version. The new the NIV. The new King James Version. The RSV. Now, of those that I've just listed there, and there are, there are many more, but there are also many versions that actually translate it well. Don't ask me why, but they translate it well. So if you're translating this, every knee will bow, and you're talking about Christian, you think, well, oh, that, it, it's, it's not a, a short ju jump to think that this is a great genuflex, okay? And you call it that. So there are several translations now. Now let me show you what Barnes notes, a Barnes note on the. Now let me point out something. If you know who Barnes is, you're going to say, "Oh, Dr. Jim's fallen off the wagon." He's quoting. He's quoting a liberal commentator. But the truth of the matter is, it's liberal in some areas. It doesn't make them wrong in everything they say. And I found this very fascinating when he talked about the fact that that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to begin to find out who these are. Who's going to bow? He says, uh, Barnes says, the knee should bow or bend. Why? In, to in token of honor or worship. So, in other words, what, what is the idea here? Why are you bowing the knee? Why should you do this? You should do it because it's a token of honor or worshiping. And who is it that you're honoring? You're honoring the person of Jesus Christ. In verse 8, it was he who was humiliated. In verse 9, it is he who is exalted. So in verse 10, we're talking about this Jesus who's been involved here, okay? So the knee should bend or uh, bow or bend in token a token of of honor or worship now that's that's why you're doing it that is all people should adore all people should adore him now that he's got that word people in there but hang on to that for just a minute he said this cannot mean merely that at the mention of the name of Jesus we should bow now hold, see that's why I said a little while ago that sentence right there says so we're translating this at the name of Jesus every knee should bow Okay, so Marshall says something about Jesus, and there we go, down on our knees. And Janet says something about Jesus, and well, there you go, down on our knees. And the pastor's preaching about Jesus. Every time he says Jesus, people jump out of the blue, down on their knees, and back up again. See what he's saying here? This can't mean that, okay? This cannot mean merely that at the mention of the name of Jesus, we should bow. See, but here's the issue. We're not, we're not honoring, we're not exalting the name. We are exalting him, the person, okay? So he goes on to say then, that at the mention of the name of Jesus, we should bow. Nor is there, nor is there any evidence that God requires this, okay? Which require what? That every time you hear the name Jesus, you need to get out on your knee. Why should we bow? Now watch this. Why should we bow at the mention of that name, Jesus, rather than any of the any other titles of the Redeemer? Why? Well, the uh, the um, Jesus is the the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He is the Redeemer. So why if why should you bow at that name? not some other name that actually refers to the same person. And he's, ra he's raising that question. So here's the question then. Why should we bow at the mention of that name rather than at any of the other titles of the Redeemer? And the answer is we shouldn't. No, it's not necessary. Then he raises another question. Is there any special sacredness or honor in it above other names which he bears? 
Okay, so is Jesus the Son of God, the Son of the Son of Man, etc.? No, that they're, they're all speaking of the same person, just different aspect of the person. So the answer to that question is no. Then he goes on to ask, he said, and why should we bow at his name rather than at the name of the Father? Jesus is the one who's carrying out the plan. It's the Father who, who actually had the plan. So the answer is we should not. Now, besides, if any special homage is to be paid to the name of the Savior under the authority of this passage, and this is the only this is the only one on which the authority of this custom is based. In other words, when you're looking for something that says, oh, we should do this, how many times in the Bible does it say you should do this? Well, it doesn't, just this one. But if you if you do that and you're following something that's false, why should you be doing it? It should be bowing to it should be it should be by bowing the knee. Now watch this. Let me go back here and read that sentence again. And this and this is the only one on which the authority of this custom is based. It should be by bowing the knee, not the head. How many times have you how many times you're well, let's bow our head in prayer. Let's bow our head in prayer. Let's bow, excuse me. Um, Jesus is here. Let's bow let's bow in reverence to him, okay? But the truth is. This authorizes and requires neither bowing the head or bowing the knee. And the custom of bowing at the name of Jesus in some churches has risen entirely from has arisen entirely from a misinterpretation of this passage. Every knee shall bow. So there you go down. There is no place in the Bible to which an appeal is made to authorize that custom. The meaning here is not that a special act of respect or adoration should be shown whenever the name Jesus occurs in reading the scriptures or whenever it is mentioned, but that it is he, that he was so exalted, see verse 9 now, that Jesus was so exalted that it would be proper that all in heaven and on earth would should worship him. Now watch, all should worship him. And at the time would come when he would be thus everywhere acknowledged as Lord. Now stop and think about this. In that sentence, I go back to where it said verse nine, that it would be it would be proper that in all all of heaven and on earth, that heaven and earth should worship him. There's gonna there, there will be a time when that that should should happen and the time would come when he would be thus everywhere acknowledged as lord it says the bowing of the knee properly expresses homage why are you doing that it's to express homage to this man who has been exalted because he was obedient to god the father's plan so the bowing of the knee properly expresses homage respect adoration and it cannot be done, and it cannot be done to the Savior by those who are in heaven unless it is divine. Why would you do that in heaven if it were not divine? Okay. Now, what what that what Barnes has told us here is basically that bow that every knee will bow, not because it's just the name. And you don't you don't bow every time you hear that name. What you're doing is when you do bow, what you're doing is expressing reverence, paying homage to this person who was humiliated on your on your behalf and mine, the entire world. Now let's move on from there. So we we now we now see then, I hope, that we're talking about every knee should bow. And who should bow then? The phrase of the heavens. Now, let me ask you. Let me ask you something, Steve. Every knee shall bow. Okay, every knee shall bow. Of the heavens. This refers to all angels and all de on all deceased believers. Deceased believers are in heaven. The angels are in heaven. Angel heaven. I know they're outside of heaven too. Don't don't go there, please. Not yet. So all angels and all deceased believers. How about of the earth? This refers to all living human beings. Question. 
Should an unbeliever pay homage to Jesus? See, another why is it why is that why is that why is that human being there? They should, they may not be, they may not, but they should because of who and what he is. So on, on planet Earth, on Earth, all living beings. Now, what about under of all under the earth? Question: Who's under the earth? We know that we know there are three groups of people there. Fallen angels in Tartarus, those of those of the, the, the angel that in Genesis had sexual relationship with the human being, the human the women, then in in the in the abyss, who's in there? The angels that violated the rules of warfare in the angelic conflict. And who else is there? Every unbeliever in hell. Now, what do you have then? All angels and people in heaven, every human being on planet Earth, and, and every angel and, and human being in hell, what's left? Nothing. Nothing. Every knee should bow. But they're not. They should. Now, this doesn't say, and what we're seeing is this doesn't say every knee will bow and then take off over here and, and try to make something out of it that it doesn't mean. But this even gives a broader understanding of who this Jesus is, that every creature, every human being should pay homage to who he is. The angel started out there until Satan blew it and took a third of them with him. They should, but they don't. Okay. So let's let's so we find out who should bow. Let's look at this now. Why should those listed in point four, one, two, and three, why should those listed in point four bow? Here's the answer. The answer is found back in verse eight. Because Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to God the Father's plan obedience actually to the point of spiritual death on the cross. God the Father exalted him then because of that, exalted Jesus to the maximum and bestowed on him, Jesus Christ, the rank which is above every rank. Therefore, if he has a rank above every rank, then every creature of lesser rank, namely angelic and human, should properly express homage, respect, adoration to, and for the exalted Jesus Christ. Is that making sense to you? Is that too fast? What's that? Every name will bow the fourth bow. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. Yeah. Uh huh. Should, but that's it. Now let's move on from here. So the translate, are we okay? Go ahead if you want to. We're going to, we're going to change the tape, please. Thank you. We okay? Okay. So that's verse uh, verse ten. In order that the, in order that the name of Jesus, in order that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of the heavens of the earth and under the earth. Now verse 11, <laughs> more of the same. It says in verse 11, it says, and that every tongue, see every knee should bow in verse 11, or 10 rather. But in verse 11, every tongue will confess. Now hold it now. Every every knee will and every knee will bow and every every tongue will confess that what are they going to what's it going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord what to the glory of God the F Father okay now let's look at this the word and in the Greek is is good that's that's right the word the word every is is the Greek word is right. The word tongue is right. So, and that every tongue is good until you get to will confess. And what is will confess again? It's a third person singular, heiress, middle, subjunctive. See the subjunctive mood again. And what do I have to go back and read this definition for subjunctive again? 
maybe I do. Hang on just a second now. I'm going back there and get it. Here's the subjunctive mood. It said every knee should bow. Now every tongue should confess subjunctive mood. And the subjunctive mood presents the action or an event as something wanted or expected. That means it's going to happen. The action is not considered as an objective fact by the speaker. In other words, the subjunctive indicates that what uh, indicates what the subject of the verb wants, can, may, must do, or is expecting to do, but it does not mean it's going to happen. Okay, now let's go back down here in verse 11. So that phrase will confess then is, is as a subjunctive mood, it's not will confess. And actually the word, uh, the word uh, uh, ex homo legao actually means acknowledge. So, okay. And, and that every tongue, sh what, what's the next two words then? What is it going to do? And, and that every tongue should, no, not will confess. That's what it says. What's it mean? Should acknowledge. And that every tongue should acknowledge. And acknowledge what? Acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so when you when you when you acknowledge the fact, should you acknowledge the fact that Jesus is the Lord? Guess what? You're doing that to honor God, to the glory of God the Father. So when when you're you're confessing that, when you're uh, when you're uh, acknowledging the fact. That Jesus, Lord, what you're doing is you're glorifying God the Father. Now let's come back and look at this thing again. Then, here's the translation: and every tongue should acknowledge. Is it? Does it say will? No, it doesn't say will. Shouldn't say will. And every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, resulting in the glory of God the Father. Now let's go back and pull some of this apart again. It says in every tongue. What does that mean? What did it mean in the previous verse? All the angels that were in heaven, fallen angels, elect angels, what's it mean down here on planet Earth? Human beings, what's it mean in what's it mean in, under the earth? The, the angels in Tartarus, the abyss, and, and unbelievers in hell. That's the whole, that's every creature, both human and and, and angelic, that's right. So the issue is every tongue, every knee and every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the phrase will confess grammatically, ex homo this verb is an arithmetical subjunctive that means should acknowledge that Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is Lord. And this aorist tense is a cumulative aorist and what does the cumulative errors do? It emphasizes that this acknowledgement will be a verbalization that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every tongue shall confess. See, with a knee, you're, you see something happening. Here, it's it's verbal. The every every tongue should confess. So all of angelic creation, creation, all of human creation, should acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, the middle voice is an indirect middle and emphasizes all angels and all human beings as being the ones who should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then the phrase, uh, the phrase, Jesus Christ is Lord, the first word, kurios, is the word Lord. And that's the, the word Lord is the title of our Lord's royalty. What is his title? He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The word Jesus, which is Jesus, is the human name of our Lord. And it means Savior. Then the word Christos, and then I had the word Kurios again the second time, which means Lord. The word Lord here is used in its primitive and proper sense as denoting owner, ruler, sovereign. The meaning is that all should acknowledge Jesus Christ as the universal sovereign. Angels, humanity, acknowledge him as sovereign. Such a universe. Now, what happens if you have this universal uh, admission, confession that Jesus is Lord? 
Guess who that's going to honor? That's going to honor God the Father whose plan it was. Okay. Now, that last phrase, God the Father. God the Father is the author of the plan for the human race. And God the Father is perfect, therefore his plan is perfect. So verse 11 says, and every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, resulting in the glory of God the Father. Now when we get to verse 12, this, this verse, so here's what you have. You've got verse 8, humiliation. You've got verse 9, is exaltation. Then in verse 10, you've got, you're going to bow the knee. You should bow the knee. Then you're going to, you should uh, confess with your mouth. Now in verse 12, we're going to get a passage that is misunderstood and often misapplied. You're going to see it just as soon as you read it. Here's what it says. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not is in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Here it is. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. You get the idea? Work out your own salvation. 90% plus of people who call themselves Christians are failing right there. They're working for their salvation. Someone mentioned to me the other day about John MacArthur. Well known, good reputation. The only problem is he tells you if you're not obedient to Christ, you haven't been saved. Okay. Okay. So this verse is misunderstood. Let's take a look at it then. A lot of Greek words, etc., and then we're going to pull this apart. So then is okay. I'm going to make those comments as you can read the word, read the Greek words if you want to. So then is okay. My beloved, that's translated okay. Just as is translated okay. You have always obeyed. And that's, uh, that, that's that word always is there. That's, that's all right all, also. You have always obeyed. And then he says, not as in not as in my presence in the presence of me not just when i was there were you obedient but he says now much more in my absence i'm not there i'm in rome i'm in jail in prison you were obedient when i was there much more now since i'm gone you're still being obedient he says work out your own salvation question What's, what's, what's happening with Paul right now? What was going on with Paul? What? He's in jail. Why was he there? Preaching the gospel. Living out the Christian way of life. So he's being persecuted. But wait a minute. Gee whiz. He was persecuted back in Philippi. And what's happening now that he's in prison and, and he's gone from Philippi, but what's happening to them? They're the same thing that happened to them. They're being persecuted also. So Paul says, wait a minute, work out your work out your own salvation. And we need to know what that word salvation means because just like the word dead, death, dying, having eight different meanings, salvation has more than one meaning also. It means the word means deliverance. The question is in context, deliverance from what? So before you're saved, you need to be you need to be delivered from hell and the lake of fire. But now that you're saved, you need to be delivered from the circumstances of your life. And what you're going to do is you're going to work out your own deliverance. So what does what does this mean? And you do it with fear and trembling. Now let's let's give a, a, a an interpretive translation of that verse. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only. But now much more in my absence, keep accomplishing your own preservation in danger. See, in other words, you're, you're, you work out your salvation, meaning that there's something wrong. They're, they're, they're in danger. They've got, they're, they've got a problem that they're, they're encountering. And so they're going to have to work out their own salvation, their own deliverance there. And you're going to do it with reverence and respect. 
Now, I'm, I'm telling you right now, li listen, right now, when you look, please, please, please. When you look at all that's going on in the news, and you realize, if you realize at all, and I know, I would say, most of us, if not all of us, that are online with me and here in this room, you understand, at least I hope you do. But what is happening now, we are being bombarded in every direction by people who are evil. Evil. They're, they're obviously, they're, they're, they're sinning because they're liars. They couldn't tell the truth if it, if it bit them. They're liars, but we are being bombarded by evil. Question, what is evil? Distortion of truth. That's right. No matter how, how is it? No matter what? That's right. No matter how slight the distortion, that's evil. So we see freedom, marriage, family, nationalism, employment. That's the laws of divine establishment. Then you've got over here, you need to be baptized to be saved. You can't get saved unless you speak in tongues. You've got to do this. You've got to tithe. You've got all these things. Uh, oh, no, you don't have to be. Oh, no, you need to be filled with the spirit. Excuse me. Excuse me. We're being bombarded on every at every angle of our life. So when you go to the gas pump, what are you doing? <laughs> the gas price is big. Can't believe it. Can't believe it. Oh, excuse me. God is allowing that because of the scum you're, you see out here in this in this world. He's trying to get their attention. And if you're sitting around belly aching, moaning and groaning because you don't have what you think you need to have, join the crowd. Yeah. Suffering by association is exactly right. And you need to be happy when this is happening. Your happiness is based on who and what he is. You can be happy in the midst of this because what he wants you to have, you're not taking it. Now, I'm just saying, I'm editorializing. But the thing of it is that when I sit here and study and, and present this information, I want to, I pray, I pray that you're getting it because the people in your periphery aren't getting it and they need to see the right thing in you. And if they never get it, it's not your problem. It's their problem. And I know, I know for a fact that I, that I know specifically, you know, that those in, in the room, I know you well enough to know the things that are going on where you're being pressured because of your Christian way of life. So then, my beloved, he says, as you have always obeyed and not, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, keep accomplishing your preser keep accomplishing your own preservation in danger. Now, how are you going to accomplish your own preservation in danger? I'll tell you how it is. Keep advancing in the Christian way of life, because if you're not advancing, you won't be able to handle the next thing that comes to your life. So the answer is found in the practice of metabolizing the doctrine that you have. Now, uh, listen, please understand, there are going to be things in your life where you don't have what you want, you don't have what you need, but ask yourself, does God know that? And then the question is, how are you handling that? So the meaning of the meaning of and things to learn from verse 12. First of all, he says, as you have always obeyed. He's talking to the Philippians. Now, let me point out something here. I want to I want to make this kind of a comment, and I, I'll tell you, I, I just I know I know who I am. 
I know who I used to be. I know what I was. But I'm not that person anymore. I'm not that person anymore. So if I were to talk to, to my friends from back home who knew me back in the first 18 years of my life, see, I can't believe he's a pastor. And isn't amazing, isn't amazing today, isn't amazing that when you tell people that you are a pastor, 99 times out of 100, they laugh at you. They laugh at you. We had that happen. We had that happen in 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 Kroger yesterday. On, on yeah, yesterday, it was sort of a casual kind of an acquaintance, and I was I was joking with with uh, with J Lee and I were joking with, with I was joking. Lee and was there, and uh, this lady got the laughing because she she knows who I am, and uh, she started laughing. I said. Ma'am, don't 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 laugh. I said I'm very serious. I'm being very serious, and she laughed harder. <laughs> I said, and then I said, no. I said you can believe every word I say because I'm a preacher. Well, she about fell on the floor and started laughing when I told her that. You see, it's the idea that, that you you see, and I I sense that. I mean, I I I um, I I bear that with me when I go. I don't I don't want that, but I. I know that that's a fact, and uh, so uh, what I'm what I'm trying to say is this. I want to live this. I want to live that kind of life that Paul's talking about, so that when you see my life and you see me teaching here, let let me let me be be Paul for just a moment, talking to you who are the Philippians, and I'm off of here in jail, and I said to you, you know, you know. Steve and Annette and Janet and all those and uh, when I was with you, I know how 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 you wanted the Word of God. Oh, you just couldn't wait to get to the next Bible class. Oh, you, you wanted it so bad, and oh my, I remember that. But now I'm gone. I'm not there now. But I've heard you're still striving. You're still striving. And remember, I know where you are in your progress in your process of growing. And you're at that point now where you are headed for no man's land. You're headed for spiritual autonomy. And this is going to be the most, if you just keep advancing, now watch what happens. When they when they go into no man's land, they, and this is when, here you are, you're living the Christian way of life. And as you're taking this information, whoever you are online, and you're beginning to live that out, and the people that the people that you're you're dealing with in your periphery, they're seeing something, and then all of a sudden you get this person arguing with you. This person says, "I don't believe that," and the pressure comes. This is what Paul's talking about. In my ab, keep accomplishing, keep accomplishing for your own preservation. And the thing, Annette, that you're accomplishing is that you continue to come to Bible class, you continue to learn, and as you and you continue to grow, so that as you face these increasing pressures in your life, which are your dangers, and what is the danger? And the danger is you're going to say, "I don't want to suffer anymore like this," and you go back, and you get distracted and go away from what God wants you to do. That's not what He wants. So He says, "Keep." accomplishing for your own uh, your own preservation in danger by advancing spiritually that's the meaning of that and how do you do it with reverence toward Christ this is the one that you're being transformed into the likeness of and with respect to the word of god which is going to be the, the power to overcome in every circumstance of your life so he says as you have always obeyed Here's the point that Paul is making. When, you, when he was present face to face with the believers in Philippi, well, they listened, they understood, and they believed. What did they believe? They believed the mystery doctrine that Paul was teaching them. And when Paul was no longer face to face with them at Philippi, the pastor teacher then, it was Epaphroditus, the pastor teacher taught them the mystery doctrine that Paul had written to them. Remember, Paul wrote a letter and he said, uh, you know, Pastor, don't pass this letter around. He said, don't give this, this letter to everybody. He said, you go, you sit down, and you study this, and then you go and explain it. 
to the people, okay? They listened, they understood, they believed what Paul had written to them with a result that they continued to advance spiritually. Now, the next word is always. Say, you have always obeyed. That's an adverb of time. And it indicates that the believers in Philippi consistently gathered to listen and see that's what this is. You, you are my joy. You are my joy. Andy, Angie, Bob and Wilma, Leanne, Brian, Dan and Carolyn, Karen, Kat, Kim, Odette, Richard, Nita, Roger, and I can't see who's online over there on, on Facebook, but you, you are my joy. You are my happiness. So he goes on to say then always, it's an adverb of time and indicates that the believers in Philippi consistently gathered to listen, understand, and believe the doctrinal truths that they were taught either directly, that means face-to-face, -face, or indirectly by letter from Paul. Now, the word obeyed is the key to everything. They obeyed. Obeyed indicates that these believers in Philippi recognized the authority of Paul and recognized the authority of their pastor teacher. And what did they do? They demonstrated their recognition of authority by gathering together every time the word of God was taught. Either taught by Paul or taught by their right pastor teacher who was Epaphroditus. Now, grammatically, this is my comment. Grammatically, I want you to know and I've done more of this in the last couple of weeks than I had in a long time. But grammatically, I love how an understanding of grammar expands our understanding. You want to go back and take a look at Will? Will, Will Neal? Will confess? How about should? Confess? Should? Should bow? The aorist tense... The aorist tense of the verb obeyed, now listen, the aorist tense of the verb obeyed is what is called a constant of aorist. Now, so when you're dealing with grammar, uh, there's, a, there's a certain kind of tense, but it may have several different meanings. This happens to be a constant of aorist, and what it does, constitute, listen, Steve, look here, con constitute, 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 okay? It's a constant of errors and contemplates the obedience of, of the Philippian believers in its entirety. It just wasn't over here. This, this Bible class, this Bible class, it was this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. It takes their obedience into one big ball of wax, okay? The active voice indicates that the Philippian believers recognize is they recognize Paul's authority and they concentrated on his messages. And the indicative mood, I love it, the indicative mood, every time you see an indicative mood, an indicative mood, it declares the reality of whatever it is they're talking about. So the indicative mood here declares the reality of the obedience of the Philippian believers. And if I were to talk to somebody else out here about those of you in this room, those of you online, I would talk about your obedience in the indicative mood, the reality of your obedience and your love for the word. Then he says, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Let's take a look at some principles related to that phrase. Not as in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Since Paul was an apostle, we need to realize that Paul had teaching authority over all local Christian assemblies. And that was before the canon of Scripture was completed in 96 AD. They were, they were apostles until that time. And in 96, by that time, the scripture had been written, had been circulated. But Paul's authority was just as important in his absence. Now watch this. Paul's authority was just as important in his absence as it was when he was face to face. Why? Because he was an apostle. Now what happens is this. Isn't it amazing? How about this? Look at me. Look this way. Okay. Look here. My authority as a pastor teacher is the same same authority is the same kind of authority that I that I have when I when you're face to face with me. Okay, now let me ask you this: How much authority do I lose when you're online with me? Same authority. Okay, 
So Paul had the same authority, whether he was local or whether he was, whether he was absent. And going on from there. Secondly, when the Philippians didn't have Paul's face-to-face -face teaching, and this, listen, and this is what, this is what COVID has taught X number of pastors in this country who were down on me because I was doing this stuff online way back when, then all of a sudden, what was wrong became became okay, and I, I I'm laughing about it. I, I I hated that it happened, that they had to they had to learn that way. But COVID showed them a lot a lot along that line. So when the Philippians didn't have Paul's face to face teaching, they still learned more from Paul's letters than they learned from Epaphroditus, who was their face to face teacher. Now someone might look at that saying, now, "We don't don't get too hasty here now," because the next point. The Philippians learned more from Paul, not because Epaphroditus failed, but because Paul was, is, and he, he was, is, and will be the greatest Bible teacher during the age of grace. So note this principle. The believer's right pastor teacher does not have to be present. And listen, this is for you too here. The believer's right pastor teacher, you're the, you're the, you're the believer. You have a right pastor teacher somewhere. But the, the believer's right pastor teacher doesn't have to be present for the believer to grow spiritually during his absence. Believers have advanced spiritually and can advance spiritually without face-to-face -face teaching. Now, point five, believers have advanced spiritually and can advance spiritually and can advance spiritually without face-to-face -face teaching. But I have a note here. Many believers who are not being fed are not, are, what are they doing? Many believers who are not being fed doctrine are trying to satisfy their Christian life by burying themselves in Christian service. But Christian service is not a valid substitute for failure to metabolize doctrine. At the time Paul wrote this epistle to the Philippians, both Paul and Epaphroditus were in Rome. Their pastor was actually in Rome. But the Philippians continued their spiritual advance. Remember, Paul was under house arrest in Rome, and this local assembly of Philippians, they desired to send Paul what we might call a care package. And the Philippian believers, they gathered supplies and sent them to Rome by the hand of their own pastor teacher, Epaphroditus. So face-to-face -face teaching from one's pastor teacher is the desirable means of growing spiritually. It's desirable. It's desirable. However, in the absence of one's right pastor teacher, the believer can still advance to super grace alpha, super grace bravo, and ultra super grace, which are the three levels of spiritual adulthood. Therefore, while face-to-face -face teaching is desirable, it is not essential for spiritual growth. Do you understand that, Steve? Until COVID-19 reached the pandemic stage, most pastors didn't believe point eight. The pandemic changed the minds of some pastors. Now, the letter, the letter to the Philippians is one of five captivity letters along with, uh, with Ephesians, which precedes it, Colossians, which follows it, 2 Timothy and Philemon in the New Testament. So while the Philippians and four other assemblies received letters from Paul, Believers are not limited to letters. We have other sources. And that's what we're doing here with, with the internet. Now, let's, in the last couple of minutes, let's take a look at the word work out. Had our gods of mine. Here's where the big problem exists. The problem is misunderstanding the present middle imperative of God, God our gods of mine. That word does not mean work out. Here it means to accomplish or bring about something, and often, in the context where it, where it is involved. So to accomplish something where danger exists is the meaning of this verse. Now, it's not just working out. It means accomplishing something where danger exists, okay? And Cotter Godzimai is a perfect word to express combat activity, being a professional spiritual soldier in spiritual combat. That's what you are. You are a professional soldier in spiritual combat. And this, this verse means and says, be accomplishing your objective or advancing in your, in your objective under pressure and danger. See, as you grow, that's, as you grow spiritually, that's, gonna, that's what's going to happen. It does not, and by the way, please understand, 
if you're going to continue to grow, if you're going to continue to stay, uh, as we see things happening in this country, it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And you are going to suffer more and more and more because you are a born again Christian. It does not mean to perform Christian service so that you will eternally be saved by your Christian works. Grammatically, I'll, I'll do this one grammatically here and we'll stop. The present tense is a descriptive present to indicate what is, what is now going on at the moment. What's going on? The Philippians were accomplishing their objective, which was to advance spiritually, even though Paul wasn't there. The middle voice is the intensive or dynamic middle, which emphasizes the application of doctrine by the Philippian believers in order for them to accomplish their objective of advancing spiritually while they're experiencing severe pressure and danger in no man's land. And the imperative mood of permission indicates the personal desires of the Philippians are the recipients of this command. The, the, it indicates that they indicates their personal desires. And the command to accomplish their objective was, in fact, the desire of the Philippians. See, they had a desire, a desire to continue to advance. And that, that imperative mood is an imperative mood of, of permission, which indicates the personal desires of, their, of those Philippians. I want to advance, and they are. Let's pray. Father, we didn't get finished tonight. But to me, these, these three verses, my goodness, the five verses, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then 12 coming up. Powerful, powerful verses, Father. Powerful verses for people who are at that point in their spiritual life. When I go down this list, Father, and I see who's online with me on, on, uh, on um, WebEx, and if I were to move over here and to see just for a second who might be on, on Facebook with me, I know, Father, these people are desirous of coming to know the truth. Here they are, Connie Absher, Joe Hurley, Troy and Kitty Braswell, Eddie Gallo from, from Las Vegas, Kathy John. Kathy, God bless you, Kathy. Kathy, folks, let me just sit while I'm praying here. Let me take Kathy Johnson is the, the mother of Brandon Johnson, who was my ATA instructor. Wonderful, wonderful family. Love the Lord. Thank you, Kathy, for being with me tonight. Ford, Ford and Judy Sinley, Donna Hayden, Dorothy and Kendall Staggs, Jim and Donna Camp, Sandra Malone, Jared Carter, Marilyn Thornhill. God bless you, Marilyn. Karen Torrance, Steve Bonds. God bless you, Steve. Linda Benton. God bless you, Linda. Mary Jo Lamuco in Davao City and Rhoda Pedras. God bless you, Rhoda. Oh, my goodness. These, Father, are people who are hungry for the word. Hunger for the word. Continue to continue to bless my life with time, patience, desire to continue to study. Because, Father, we don't need the basics right now. Oh, there are, there are those may, who may. But we don't need the basics, Father. We need those gems that are down there at, at uh, Murfreesboro. Those spiritual spiritual pearls and diamonds down there that will help us to 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 face the dangers and the the problems of life. Yes, we're going to suffer by by association with evil people and evil thoughts. What's going on? But listen, praise you, Father. You've given us the capacity to have joy in the midst of all that, and that's what I want my people to have: joy in the midst of all this, knowing that you are in control of the circumstances. With this in mind, Father, praise your holy name. Continue to be gracious and merciful to us and continue to give us the desire to face every day with your word. Jesus inside, moving us and advancing us through the power of the spirit of God and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, God bless all of you. I love you immensely. Good day. We'll close this. Listen, by what next Sunday, next Sunday we'll be at American Pie. Please let me know whether you're going to be there or not. Bye bye.